why financial advisors don't talk about real estate investing. We're going to get the real scoop today. That's today's show. Let's dive in. Hey, Freedom Fighters, welcome to the Investing in Real Estate show. I'm Clayton Morris, your humble host of this podcast. This is the show where we teach you how to build financial freedom and legacy wealth so you can spend more time with your family. That's the ultimate goal, to be able to sit down, just relax with your family, and not worry about how you're going to pay the bills. You're going to pay your bills with passive income that comes in from your tenants who are paying every month for you to live the life that you want. And you've got great rental properties, and they have a great place to live. So it's a full circle. That's what we try to teach here on the show. So rental properties, buy and hold real estate, that is the vehicle. That's my favorite vehicle for achieving financial freedom. That's how we've done it. That's how many of our listeners have achieved financial freedom. So it begs the question, why in the world, if so many millionaires are made, so many people are able to achieve financial freedom, so many able, people are able to bring in passive income every month, create an amazing tax shelter for their families, why aren't more financial advisors actually encouraging their clients to buy real estate? Well, guess what? We've got a financial advisor on the show today who's going to sort of break this open for us. And this is the first time we've ever done a show like this, and I'm really excited about it. My guest is Brent Sutherland. He's a financial planner. He's a real estate investor. And most recently, I think he just bought a property through, through us. So welcome to the family, Brent, and welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks very much, Clayton, for having me. And I'm, I'm excited to talk about these topics we have lined up today. So I appreciate you having me on board. My pleasure. I mean, just at a high level before we dive in, because we're going to talk about some great topics on financial planning and why this is such a mystery. We're going to talk about in, you know, the benefits of income diversification in your portfolio and some other great topics. But pull, pull the wool back a little bit here for us, if you would, Brent. I've gotten into some adversarial conversations over the years with financial planners who say that they have their clients' best interests at heart, why they're being adversarial against real estate. But to me, there seemed to be something else at work. Uh, why, why are financial planners maybe adverse to real estate and don't talk about it with their clients? Well, this is a good subject, and I'm glad I get to go on broadcasts such as this to discuss it. Because I think it's an important topic for people to understand and really, there's two main points and reasons why advisors don't talk about real estate investing. And it primarily focuses around compensation. And there's conflicts of interest from a compensation standpoint that keeps advisors from talking about real estate investing. And two, there's a lack of education in the traditional financial advisory world. Now, we'll dig into both of those topics because I want people to have a hands-on understanding of why this occurs. So first, we'll kind of dig into the compensation factor there is that if you look at the financial advisory community as a whole, there's really two forms of compensation that really exist predominantly in the industry. One's a little more old fashioned, but it's the commission based structure. And in essence, that means that the financial advisor gets paid whenever they sell product to their clients. Mm -hmm. Now, advisors are licensed not to sell real estate. They're licensed to sell financial products. So this is going to be in the form of mutual funds, ETFs, stocks, bonds, and sometimes insurance products are annuities. So if a client goes to an advisor and they have a lump sum of money that they want to invest and put to work for in their own world, uh, chances are if the advisor is not going to get it paid to recommend to go into real estate, he's not going to he's not going to recommend that that avenue. So what they do is they they say, okay, here's what I have laid out for you. There's some mutual funds. Here's a portfolio I can put together for you. When I put you in these products, I do get a sales commission in return. So that puts food on the, my plate for my family. And, and so if you think about it, there's no incentive for them at all to recommend that cash goes into uh, real estate investment vehicles. Now, the other the other form of compensation that exists out there is it's basically a fee per the assets that are managed. They call it the assets under management fee based model. And what this is, if you go to an advisor and let's say you have one hundred thousand dollars and you say, I need to put this money to work. What they're going to do is they're going to take that money put it into a blended diversified portfolio of really paper assets, liquid assets. Um, and, and they're going to charge a commission or a, a fee based on that total volume of assets. So in the, in the case of hundred thousand dollars, roughly in the industry, it's about a 1% annual fee. So that would be roughly about a thousand dollars each year. That's going to go back to that advisor's pocket. Now, if you think about that, if you're going to an advisor and you have, you know, hundred thousand dollars, the chances of them saying, I think you should take a portion of this and put it into real estate on the side and only give me a, a minimal amount, it's not going to happen just because it's not beneficial 
for the advisor to do so in their own best interest financially. So I think those conflicts there, just from a compensation standpoint, prevent, and, and granted, in, in the industry that we have these two standards, suitability standard, which is more geared towards brokers, but there's a fiduciary standard, which is kind of, it's, I feel like it's sweeping over the industry and it's becoming more commonplace that says you need to put your client's interest above your own. But if you think about it, if you're, if you're not gonna get paid, uh, advisors just aren't gonna recommend uh, certain products that aren't gonna put money back in their wallet. So right. you have to keep that in mind and ask the right questions if you're talking to an advisor too. And, and that's probably the one thing that you can ask an advisor if they're pushing back on real estate and it'll stumble them, just ask him, well, how are you paid? Tell uh -huh. me about your compensation. And then once they start digging into those details, I guarantee you're gonna see the conflicting interest there that will probably prevent them from recommending real estate because they're not getting paid to do so. Well, Brent, I mean, this is like, <laughs> this is amazing to me. I, I really honestly, hand to the heavens, didn't realize the, the full extent of this. I had some idea that it was based around compensation, but not fully. So you're kind of like a black sheep in this. I mean, you are a financial advisor who's a real estate investor. How do you square that round hole? Well, it kind of happened. You know, it's I've been lucky enough that throughout my career, it's been about 12 years of working in financial services that I've encountered a lot of successful people and been able to work with a lot of successful people. And I've noticed there's a commonality between the certain individuals that came in that I worked with that weren't stressed out over what their portfolio was doing. And it always kind of intrigued me. I was like, why do these people seem so calm? Because most people would come in and their livelihood depended on what their investments were doing that we were managing for them. But certain people just had a calm demeanor, almost like they didn't care what was happening in their portfolio. They were just there out of courtesy to have their annual meeting. But what I noticed between all these different individuals that kind of seemed to have that calm demeanor is they had something else going for them. And majority of the time, they had a large portfolio of real estate assets on the outside that were providing cash flows to them. So they weren't concerned about what was happening with their investments. That's when I kind of jumped on board with the real estate investment train and, and I started looking into it for myself. And so it was an evolution that happened with me. And once I started investing uh, myself, then I felt bad sitting across the table at my prior firm with people that I couldn't recommend to invest in real estate. So I had this conflict of interest that was going on internally. And that's what kind of forced me to step out independently and start my own practice. And so now what I do is I sit with individuals and we talk about, and quite frankly, a lot of people, real estate investing is a new topic. So we have to dig into the details of what it means, how you can go about doing it. But once they get comfortable, I feel like more and more people come on board uh, that train. But you know, some people like to keep an even mix, a blend of uh, paper assets and hard assets, but I try to incorporate both just to keep a nice blended approach into the mix. And if someone's all in on real estate, you know, let's go all in there too. But I always try to at least bring up that topic with people and I try to take a, like a, a well-balanced blended approach to my financial planning with individuals. That's great. So now you have nine properties. I believe you picked up your ninth property with us at, at Morris Invest just recently, which is great. Um, so how did you get involved in real estate? Take me back to the first deal and when you realized sitting across the table with people that there was like a calm demeanor. You're like, I need some of that. I need some of that peace and quiet. <laughs> quite frankly, that's what it was. I said, you know what? These people seem like they have something going on that I want. So I need to figure this out. So yeah, it was, it was more educating myself about what real estate investing was, how to properly do it. That took a couple of years. So I didn't bite the bullet into jumping into real estate until I really understood what I was doing, which I think is important for, for anyone who's jumping on board real estate training is that you need to make sure you're educated in the subject matter. But you know what's funny is once I started learning about passive income and the power of real estate, what it can do from a cash flow standpoint, what I was doing at that point in time in my life is I owned a condo and every bonus I got, every um, excess savings amount I had, I was throwing at the loan. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to pay it down as quickly as possible. To me, and this was a fallacy of mine, I, I assumed that if I paid this off, that would be financial freedom. That debt is out of the way, and, and I'll, I'll be able to live a little more freely than I did before. But when I started really evaluating about, okay, I have this equity tied up into this place. What if I sold the property? Or what if I did a, you know, a refinance and took some of this cash out and put that to work in other vehicles? Boy, that was an epiphany for me. I was like, well, I have all this money tied up, power of cash flow that's just kind of sitting in this idle vehicle. And once I did, we ended up, my wife and I, we ended up selling the condo and we pulled all this cash out and made our first investment property purchase that it really doesn't hit you until you get that first check. Mm -hmm. And once you get that first payment, it just seems real all of a sudden. I think a lot of people are fearful 
right. about taking that step in this direction. I know you hear it a lot. You just have to take that first step. You have to take that first step. But I can tell you, nothing is more true than that. Once you take the first step and you see it working, then you become addicted. And that exact same thing happened to me. I freed up that equity, put it to work. And, and I, I'm, there's no looking back, at least for me from this standpoint. Oh, those are my favorite emails, Brent. I have a whole folder of uh, first rent check emails that I've got in our email inbox. <laughs> and it's amazing because when people come in to, you know, uh, we rehab their property and then they get that first rent check, the emails that come in that are like, I, I can't, now my wife believes it's real <laughs> or now my husband believes it's real and we've got our first <laughs> rent check and now we're ready to do more. And you, once you start to see that, look, every month now that same check is going to start to come in. And yeah, you're going to have an eviction at some point, or you may have a vacancy at some point. But for the most part, that cash flow is now going to start to come in every month. And you've also, by the way, built up your net worth. You also built a tax shelter, right? You're now able mm -hmm. to claim depreciation, and you're in a whole other category. Do your clients kind of get that? What sort of a system do you take your clients through so that they can understand the benefits of real estate investing? Well, like I said, most times it's almost an introductory course to real estate investing, but you have to really sell on the benefits of what it can provide for them. And so from a passive cash flow income standpoint, I always try to paint the picture, especially for younger people, which I'm majority working with, is that you have to think about the future. And if you're working for a company, chances are you don't have a pension plan. Or it doesn't exist at this point in time. And down the road, who knows what's going to happen with Social Security? It's probably going to be diminished in some way, shape or form. I don't think it's going away, but you have to start developing your own pension plan today for yourself. And once you kind of frame it that way with a lot of younger people, and then you start talking about some good ways to develop cash flows today, presently, and real estate being one of the best ways to do so, then it starts registering. You can kind of see that light bulb uh, going off in, in, in people's heads. But even for older investors too, uh, I try to frame it up, uh, just look at the potential returns you have from real estate versus the stock market. Now, another uh, fallacy that goes on in the financial um, advisory world is that a lot of times advisors will frame up the conversation against real estate investing by saying, historically, real estate has only appreciated by about 4% a year on an annualized basis. Why would you invest in real estate at 4%? if the stock market historically has generated 10%. Right. It sounds like a great argument, right? Right, because people don't understand that we don't invest for appreciation, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's a great way to frame the argument. Then you get a lot of people shaking their head, yeah, you know, he told me only 4%. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But that's not why we're investing. We're investing for ROI, which is cash flow. Yeah. It's just a trick. It's a trick you use to get people to come jump on board with whatever uh, system that you have in place uh, to benefit you, you know, but... It happens. The thing is, I just like to try to correct that by putting it to play. Okay, if you're investing for cash flow, you can target and probably make very easily a 10% cash on cash return. And that's just kind of from the start. That's your foundation. If you do get some appreciation, that's an added bonus. If you're using leverage and someone's paying down your principal balance, that's another added bonus. And plus all the tax benefits on top of this, you're looking at real returns that are upwards in the mid 20 to 30% range sometimes. And Compare that to the 10% we were just talking about and who looks like the winner now. So you sometimes you just have to break things down in order for people to really understand, which a lot of my conversations do involve is a lot of just ex explaining, introducing, and kind of getting people's minds thinking in a different direction. Yeah, the tax shelter alone, the tax benefits, the depreciation, and then cost segregating your properties, they, that's going to blow their mind. That's like a high-level ninja way of talking about it. But when you compare that to the stock market, it's like a whole other stratosphere. But I love that idea that you just mentioned. I'm writing notes down. Your own pension plan, like creating your own pension plan, right? Because so many of my parents' generation sort of lived on the idea of the pension, right? Mm -hmm. and it is that holy grail. He's got a pension. My you know, grandfather had a pension that he's living off of. Well, pensions are pretty much gone, right? So it's incumbent upon us now to create our own pensions, or cities can't even pay their pensions anymore, right? They're going bankrupt and so forth. So it's like it is in so important and incumbent upon us to create our own pension plans. I love that way of thinking about it. Yeah, I think so. And it's just, again, this is just something to protect yourself. And in addition to, for younger people, a conversation they like to hear is that, look, we can establish some income streams below you, create this foundation of cash flow that's coming in that will allow you to step away from your job if you're not presently happy to go out and pursue something that's going to generate a lot more i think just uh, motivation in your day to day so younger people especially today especially with the millennial generation they want to hear that they want to know that they can go out and make a difference and if they're not happy somewhere 
They want to find a vehicle that's going to allow them to get to the point where they can go out, be creative and do something more independently. And what better way to do that than passive cash flow and real estate being one of the best vehicles to get you there? Yeah. I want to go back just a little bit because I don't want to gloss over uh, why, you know, the whole point of this episode really is around why financial advisors are not keen on real estate investing. And two of the things you mentioned, of course, the compensation, but the fee, the fee based model. Now, they're not able to charge a fee based on the selling of the property. So I've gotten into arguments where, not arguments, I've had financial advisors call me from California and other places who wanted to work with us at our company, Morris Invest. And I said, you know, look, I want to offer my clients something else because their rate of return in the stock market is just not good. I want to be able to bring in, I want to be the guinea pig first. So I want to buy a couple of properties and then be able to speak about it and then start to bring in other you know, clients who then can purchase real estate. So at least there, there is a movement, I think, among mm-hmm. financial advisors seeing the benefit of that. But they're also still being hamstrung by this sort of fee-based model where they're not able to sell the properties unless, I guess, they're buying them. I, I don't know what they're, how, that, how that works. But that really is going to pigeonhole them from really recommending real estate, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And, and the only way you can get around that and there's this the small minority of advisors out there today that are actually working this type of model is if you if you offer a fee per service or an hourly fee model so you only charge while you're working with the client on something and if you're not managing the money on an ongoing basis and there's no incentive for you to make sure you get as much on board with you as much money on board with you as possible to put into paper assets and portfolio assets then you're always going to have that conflict of interest and the way I'm structured and the way a lot of other younger advisors that have kind of started their own firms or structuring is that they're basically just charging a fee per service. Hey, we can uh, put together a financial plan for you. It's going to be this fee. And then you're kind of on your own. If you need help down the road, come back and we can work through something else. So therefore, it kind of cuts that conflict that you have with trying to sell product, trying to manage as much as possible to get you paid in return. And it's just more transparent. I think it's more fair. Uh, It's unbiased, quite frankly. And that's what we need a little bit more of. I would love that. I got into a fight actually with one woman who was going to invest. Said I want to. I would love to schedule a call, and I'd love to talk. I'd love to have my financial advisor on the call. I said, <laughs> okay, I've never done that before, but I'm happy to. I'm happy to do it. It was one of the most adversarial conversations I've ever had on the phone, and this person, you know, was ready with like an arsenal. Like, well, what do you pay a property manager? And I said, well, it's ten percent a month. And he was in California. He said, ten percent. I don't pay anybody more than four percent. I said, what do you? What? 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 He said, that's really high. I said, that's actually not. That's fairly, 10% is like a common problem. If you know real estate, you're paying 10% a month for property management pretty much across the country. You know, I mean, it just like, it was the most adversarial conversation I had. You could tell. And I did, I guess I just didn't understand his motivation. I was like, you, I guess you don't really have your client's best interest at heart here. The 10 to 12% return net Versus what you're you've been offering, no wonder you're you're in such a pissy mood. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can I can believe that. I, I, at my last firm, and I'm not going to call out names, but I got reprimanded for advising a client to pay off some bad debt they had. It was high interest debt, and so we liquidated a portion of the portfolio. It was in the right interest of the client, but then of course I get a call from my higher up saying, "Why do we do this? That's less revenues coming into the company." Wow. But once you have those targets and those sales targets and those goals that are always the tra- tra- trajectory always goes upwards. They're never wanting to see that it go down. Then there's always this pressure to sell, to bring in more assets, even if it's not in the best interest of the client. So I guarantee that advisor you talked to, he already came in with a game plan, talking points, a, a, really a battle plan to go at you with uh, certain uh, different talking points he probably picked up from someone else in the office or online just through a Google search. You always hear the, what are you going to do? You know, whenever the, you don't want to deal with the someone calling you about a toilet broken at two, two o'clock in the morning. Right. They'll bring, they'll bring up some legal issues and some liability issues and whatnot too with owning real estate. But really that's just to try to frighten you to keep your money in their pocket. Hmm. So that's, that's an important takeaway just for your listeners. Just, just to know that they're going to come with a battle plan. Just as long as you're informed and you're aware of what they're already going to discuss, I think you can come prepared for those types of conversations yourself. No, that's great. That's great advice. I mean, this is really great advice for our listeners. One of the things we wanted to talk about before we wrap it up is the, you know, the importance of this income diversification over the portfolio diversification. Can you explain that? Yeah. Um, well, I, well, I do think if you have a, a investment portfolio, diversification is important. 
you need to have a mix of stocks and bonds and, and some cash if, if you're feeling unsecure about the market. But even in that blended mix, you need to have international assets and local uh, U.S. domestic assets. But I like to take a step back and look at what are the real risks with someone's financial picture. And if you lose your job or you get injured or a spouse that's working has to step away from work for a while, and quite frankly, if there's a stress on income in your household, it doesn't matter what how your portfolio is diversified. What matters at that point in time is if you, if you have cash, available cash and income to pay the bills, to put food on the table, to get you through that hump until you can reach that next point where you guys are in good shape again. So just looking at it from that standpoint, the real risk I see with most people is if the primary breadwinner loses their job, what are you going to do? You know, if, if you can't pay the mortgage bill, you can't pay the rent and you get kicked out, that's going to cause a major stress for you and the family. And again, like I said, it doesn't matter. Even if your portfolio is doing really well, that doesn't save you at that point in time. At that point in time, the real risk are you providing for your family. So that gets overlooked quite often, mm -hmm. uh, more times than not. And uh, having these other passive income sources coming in, if you do lose your primary job or your primary source of income, if you have a couple of properties that are generating some cash flow for you in the interim, that's going to get you through that rainy day until you hit another day where you can kind of relax and, and sit back and, and get back to that lifestyle that you had uh, grown accustomed to. So, again, that's the main reason why I think that's more important than portfolio diversification. It's just that the immediate risk factors of losing a job are always predominant to portfolio diversification. Hmm. I love that idea. Right. Because if you, you can make it through those rainy days when it gets dark out there and the clouds start brewing on the horizon, if you've got passive income coming in from real estate, um, then you're able to get through. You know, you're able to push yeah. through. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the other things you talk about, and you talk about you know, preparation and being aware of sort, sort of the horizon, is you know, preparing your proper planning techniques for uh, getting access to some of the money that you may have tied up in some of those retirement accounts. Obviously, we talk about it quite extensively here on the show tapping into a 401k or Roth IRA or those types of things. What sort of planning techniques would you advise your clients to kind of prepare for if they want to tap into that for, you know, for real estate investing? Well, you can get creative. And I always like to minimize as much as possible how much money you give back to Uncle Sam in the form of taxes and penalties if you can. Um, so you have to at first understand uh, the different types of account structures that are out there. And, and the risks and the penalties involved with liquidating. So in, in, uh, in general sense, you have really two types of retirement vehicles that exist. And there's the traditional retirement plans, the IRAs, and then you have a Roth version of some 401ks and 403bs, and then the Roth IRA. The traditional IRA is going to be less flexible in accessing that money. The Roth provides a little more flexibility. So just to provide some examples, say you had a $100,000 IRA you're a young professional, you want to access this money because you caught this real estate investing bug, just know that if you're in a, a decent tax bracket, let's just say you're in the 25% federal tax bracket, if you decide you're going to liquidate these funds, let's say that you're in the 25% federal bracket, maybe you have a 5% state income tax, you're going to also get hit if you liquidate before age 59 and a half with a 10% federal penalty. So all of a sudden that $100,000 account is quickly diminished to $60,000. Now if you have a Roth, and let's just use the same example, maybe you have a Roth IRA that has $100,000 in it. And say over the past 10 years, you've contributed $50,000, the remainder $50,000 is a growth. Mm -hmm. The IRS says you can always obtain access to those contributions, penalty-free and tax-free. So that $50,000 that you contributed over the past 10 years, you can pull out and use towards down payments, purchases, whatever you want of real estate property. Now that's just setting up the framework for how these operate. If you do want to access some of these monies, especially in the traditional IRA, which has less flexibility to it, if you're presented with an opportunity where maybe you lose your job or you're stepping away for a career change and you find yourself in a little bit lower of a tax bracket, mm -hmm. look, look at the silver lining in those types of situations. Maybe it makes sense to liquidate a portion of it if you're going to use that towards a down payment of a property that you really, really want, an investment property. Or you could use that to go through a Roth conversion where you can take a portion or all of that IRA and convert that to a Roth IRA, which is going to give you more flexibility to access that money down the road. Now, you have to know that if you do even the Roth conversion, uh, those monies get taxed as ordinary income. So that's going to bump you up a little bit. But I always try to encourage people, you know, if, if you've hit a little bump in the road, 
and maybe the job this year is not paying as much, you have a bad sales year, or you're in transition, look at this as an opportunity to access some of that money and put that to work in other places. So just you have to kind of keep that in mind. I always hate when someone uh, wants to cash out entirely when they're having a fantastic year and they're in the highest tax bracket possible because you see almost half of that money go straight back to Uncle Sam. But there's some other ways to think about it and you can access that money. So just always keep those in mind. And, and sometimes, quite frankly, if you look at the cost benefit of just cashing out and paying the penalties and the taxes and you find a great property, sometimes it just makes sense whether or not you're in a high tax bracket or low tax bracket. But just be aware, do proper planning, you know, do, do, kind of weigh that out, cost benefit, pros and cons versus cashing out versus maybe saving for another day when it might make more sense. But just be aware of those uh, taxes, those penalties that can come into play if you do access those monies. Yeah, we went through that process recently, cashing out, leaving a job with a 401k and whether, you know, how were we going to leverage that? And, you know, being we had to buy a certain amount of real estate in order to offset that tax penalty because we wanted to transition it from a traditional 401k over to a Roth. So we, we wanted to do it as we were increasing our tax brackets. And uh, we knew how much real estate we had to buy in order to offset it. But those are the things that we planned ahead of time so we could get those numbers in place. So yeah, that's, that's, that's really smart. Um, well, Brent, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I'd love to know where, you know, you have nine properties now. What is your goal? What does your freedom number look like? You're a financial advisor. You've got to have that number probably right up on your refrigerator, I would think. Well, well quite frankly, you know, I'm, I'm pretty close because those uh, nine properties are generating about $3,000 of passive cash flow for me now. I have some other vehicles that are generating some other passive income sources. So I'm about 4000 a month in passive cash flow. I would be fine at this number. My wife is still working and she doesn't want to step away at any point in time. So really, I just love talking to people. I love going through this process with people and probably the same for you. You're at the point right where you're set now, too. But I'm sure you just like helping people out. Right. Um, I really want to target maybe uh, another half a dozen properties to get to the point where I'm at 15. And I think that'll provide enough for me to just feel stable. I'm still going to do this, but it's just nice having a little bit more of a cushion beneath me than I have now. So 15 is kind of my target as far as properties go. And I have a few other things on the side that are generating some cash flow as well. So I'm getting close, which uh, feels good. That's great. Well, Brent, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you pulling the wool back on this whole process with financial advisors. It's been, I, I, I don't, I'm sure our listeners probably find it as eye-opening as I did or ear-opening as I did. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, you're very welcome. Anytime you want to have me on, I'm happy to be here. Oh, I love that. And any sort of final words of wisdom for new real estate investors who are you know, just getting started out there? Well, I think you've probably heard this time and time again, but just take the plunge. Once you get in, I mean, do, do, do your homework up front. Make sure you're educated so you're buying you know, uh, smart properties, but just get involved. And once you get involved, you're going to be hooked. I guarantee it. That's wonderful. Yes, take action. Well, thank you so much, Brent. Thank you so much, for everyone, for downloading and subscribing. We'll be back here with another episode. Now, go out there, take action. And I love what Brent said, create your own pension plan. That's really the key to financial success and be able to create that passive income for the rest of your life. So go out there and take action. We'll see you next time, everyone, here on the Investing in Real Estate Show. Thanks, everyone.